Welcome to our show. I'm John Sharp, Texas A&M Chancellor, and your host for the next half hour. This is our first episode, and in the coming weeks, we're going to interview leading experts, including scientists, researchers, and policy advisors from throughout the state of Texas. They're going to share their insights to help all of us understand the COVID-19 pandemic and all its implications. I'm delighted to introduce our first guest, which is a world-renowned physician and scientist, Dr. Peter Hotez. Dr. Hotez is a Hagler Institute Scholar here at Texas A&M University and College Station. He is an MD, a PhD. He also is a professor and dean of the National School of Tropical Medicine at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston and co-director of the Texas Children's Hospital Center for Vaccine Development. Dr. Hotez is a vaccine researcher and one of the world's leading experts on contagious diseases. He's internationally recognized as one of the world's most important and influential people in healthcare. Dr. Hotez is joining us at a safe social distance remotely from Houston. I'm in College Station. He's in demand by politicians, healthcare professionals, media outlets all over the globe. And we're glad to have him with us today. Thank you, Dr. Hotez, for being with us. I know your time is at a premium right now all over the world, and we really appreciate you being here. I thought what we would do is have a conversation, first of all, about what this virus is, how it's different from others, then talk about some of the treatments that have been mentioned uh, for people that, that may get the, the virus, and then the vaccines, which, of course, you have uh, one that you're working on and, and a general discussion. But first of all, we, we've all went through SARS. Uh, we kind of saw it from a distance. We went through Ebola, and that was sort of a foreign deal that, that sort of never got here. How is this one worse? How is this one worse than than those viruses or the, or, or the flu or, or, or all the other kind of stuff. And why should we be so worried about it that we would close down uh, the whole country almost? So I think you've asked one of the most important questions, Chancellor. And first of all, thanks for having me uh, on and, and talk about uh, what we're doing also with Texas A&M and uh, appreciate your leadership uh, on, on this issue. You know, as, as you point out, this is our third major coronavirus uh, epidemic slash pandemic of the 21st century. We had SARS in 2003. We had uh, MERS coronavirus in, in 2012, and now this one. So that's our third third one. The, the, the reason uh, that this one's a bit different, ironically, is because in some ways it is less lethal than SARS and MERS and, and uh, for many populations. Now you might say, well, that sounds a little strange. Why would that be? Well, what happened was with SARS that emerged, uh, SARS-1 that emerged out of Southern China in, in 2003 and then caused a bad epidemic in Toronto where MERS in 2012, it had a very high case fatality rate and you were very sick uh, when you had it. So that if you had, uh, were unfortunate enough to get SARS or MERS uh, you felt very ill. You were either uh, in the hospital or seeking medical treatment right away. And, uh, and it had that high mortality, 50% among older people for SARS and 10% uh, if you were, you were younger and caused pretty bad hospital infections. The difference with this one is the mortality is still very high, four or five times uh, more than flu uh, and higher depending on the certain age category. But there's a piece of the population, especially younger individuals and kids that does not get very sick. So what you have is a number of people in the, out there in the community not seeking medical attention, transmitting the virus, and then there's a subset that's getting very sick and going to the hospital and in the ICU. So it's a complicated concept, but the idea is it's, it's not the most lethal virus we've ever seen, nor is it the most contagious but it's pretty high in both categories. And that seems to be creating a very toxic mix. Uh, that means you have a large cohort in the community that's transmitting the virus, then a population getting very sick and then flooding into hospitals and ICUs. And that's why it's creating so much chaos uh, right now and, and, and spreading across uh, the United States. And of course, causing those devastating outbreaks in, in, in Europe, especially in Italy and France and Spain. And, and then we, we saw what happened in, in China. So we're, we're going through it now and the new estimates, and we'll talk a little more about that uh, today, 
suggest that in the United States, it's going to peak uh, over the next uh, two weeks. So we think the middle of April is going to be the peak of the epidemic in the U.S. But here in Texas, we're going to be a bit lagging, and it's we're probably looking at the first week of May. Uh, so we're, I, you know, as bad as things are, I'm very sorry to say it's it's still on the rise, and we're still looking at a pretty serious epidemic for the next couple of months. So we in Texas have another, what, couple of weeks, three weeks or so, you think, before we hit a, a peak? I mean, is there, is there a chance that, the, that Dallas, Houston, or our major cities, San Antonio, uh, start looking like New York, or, or what's, what's the modeling look like? Well, so that's that's the big worry, right? Uh, and the the S and again, these are these are ma models, and you know, at the university, we we see models all the time, and we know they're only as good as the assumptions, and the assumptions are based on a new virus agent, so the assumptions are not the strongest. But the best that we can see is a peak around May second, and uh, the estimates now are around four thousand deaths in the state of Texas for the month of May and June. So what we think the numbers are just now be going, starting to go up in Texas, a big, a peak around May 2nd, then it'll decline throughout the month of May and hopefully start to go down around June, but causing a fair bit of damage. Uh, the, the potential good news is some of the estimates suggest at least for the state of Texas, we, we do have enough hospital beds and, and ventilators. So if, if, the virus goes according to the models, we'll, we'll be able to manage the surge capacity, but it'll still cause quite a bit of destruction. And, and for reasons uh, that we're just beginning to realize now, there's a, for now there seems to be a more of an urban rural divide or a urban slash suburban versus rural divide uh, for this epidemic in the US. So we'll see if this continues to play out in Texas, but the concern is our cities are gonna get hit hard, Houston, Dallas, uh, San Antonio, uh, Austin, and College Station is probably close enough to Houston that uh, I think we should anticipate a problem uh, in, in College Station as well, as well as among some of the other satellite campuses that are uh, on uh, near urban areas. Does the modeling you've looked at, and I know this is hard to project, but the modeling that you've looked at, does it suggest to you when uh, social distancing can go away when you can play football, when you can do, you know, all of the things that uh, that uh, everyone in Texas was doing before and go back to work. Do we have any clues as to when that might happen? Well, the model indicates that uh, at least one model, again, from the Institute for Health Metrics, which is the one I'm looking at the closest, says things will be bad in May and June, and then after the beginning of June, it'll start to subside, and hopefully then we can uh, open things up uh, a bit. Uh, but again, we're gonna have to take this a few weeks at a time um, since it is a new virus agent. So the president, uh, President Trump has said, uh, let's, let's do this national shutdown and social distancing until the end of April and then we'll reevaluate. My prediction will be at, at the end of April, things will still be pretty bad in Texas and we may be looking at another month but hopefully then then we can lift. But it's it's awfully hard to to know for sure because uh, models in the end are models and and with a new virus agent, their predictive value is not as great as we'd like them to be. So I think we'll know a lot more and, and as we go through the month of April, uh, see where we're at and then make an assessment. Maybe we can chat again uh, by this mechanism at the end of April and uh, We'll, we'll see if the models still look valid. Okay. So I, I know that's not a very satisfying answer. Uh, <laughs> you, you and everyone else in Texas want to know, well, hell, is uh, uh, come come June, July, uh, can we be uh, outdoors and going to the things Texans love to do? And and, uh, and I'm saying I'm hoping that's the case, but it, it's still very fluid. Is there anything to the um, suggestions that uh, warm weather uh, affects this virus just like the flu, that it starts to dissipate when warm weather hits here? Well, there are, uh, there are so, there's some evidence that, that may be the case, but it's not strong. So my colleague, uh, Mark Lipsitch, who's a excellent epidemiologist and modeler at Harvard School of Public Health, has been looking at the trends, for instance, 
of this epidemic in China and noticing that cities that are in warmer climates are doing better than cities in cooler climates. And indeed, we've seen how this epidemic mostly is affecting right now the Northeast and New York and New Jersey account for, for half the cases. So the hope is that maybe we will be in a, in a better position, but we, we have no guarantees because we haven't been through a full year of this virus. So uh, it's so it's more of a hope than so, something that we can say with certainty. Okay. Let me ask you about uh, treatments. I noticed that the uh, FDA just made a comment in the last day or so about a particular uh, drug that has been used for malaria. There's been some comment about uh, stem cell therapies, things like that, for people that once they get it, is, is uh, what do you know about that and or any of these effective or, or what, what can you, what kind of light can you shed on that? Well, one of the hardest things we do is try to accelerate new technologies in the middle of a, an epidemic or a pandemic with a new pathogen. Uh, we're not really well set up to do that. So the hope with the, some of those uh, treatments that you're talking about are, are there existing medicines that have already been approved for other uses, which could be repurposed towards this epidemic? And we're, we've been hearing a lot about chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine, and it's an anti-malarial drug. And there's a lot of it made, so and it's uh, got a pretty good, not perfect, but pretty good safety profile. So if it works, that would be a, a game changer. Here, here's the evidence. It it looks like it inhibits the replication of the virus in the test tube, so it kills the virus, what we say in vitro in the test tube. It has some anti-inflammatory properties, which is important because people who are sick with this virus have a lot of inflammation in the lung. So it checks those boxes. And then there were some, a couple of small clinical trials conducted in China and by my colleague Didier Raoul, who's in, uh, you know, in Marseille in France, then a small study sh so showing some promise. So that's what we're going on. It's not a lot, but we'll, we'll see if, if that can, in larger studies, uh, we can replicate what we've seen in some of the small studies. The good news, the not so good news is that was a similar story against this drug for influenza about a decade ago was shown in the test tube, uh, maybe showed some promise, but it didn't pan out in larger clinical studies. So the point is, let's not just rely on chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine. There's probably a half a dozen repurposed drugs out there that are being looked at, including some of the antiretroviral drugs for HIV AIDS, and, and, uh, and, and we'll see which of those pan out. I know there's a lot of effort right now being organized by the Food and Drug Administration and academic investigators all over the country looking at those repurposed medicines. We're also looking at what's called convalescent antibody therapy. And this is a, a sort of a, a throwback to what was done during the 1918 flu pandemic in some places where you identified patients who had the virus recovered from it because they developed antibodies in their serum and then you bring them into the blood bank, take their, remove their blood, give them back their red blood cells, but harvest their plasma that's rich in antibody and then use that as the treatment. And this actually worked uh, during the 2003 SAR, original SARS epidemic, SARS-1. We call this one SARS-2. And there's now a new study released uh, from China out of five patients that showed some promise. So I'm, I'm more, I've, you know, if you had to tell me what I'm most optimistic about, I think it would be that plasma antibody therapy. And there's a couple of uses for it. One for treatment of sick patients and also as prophylaxis for first responders or for healthcare providers in small doses. So there's an aggressive effort now to lo look at the uses of that. One thing is clear, if you're using it for treatment, the earlier you can use it, the better. So once you wait till a patient is pretty far advanced, the likelihood of success goes down. So in terms of immediate therapies, those are the kinds of things that I'm looking at. How can we scale up the convalescent therapy um, that you talk about having such an impact? Well, what we're doing is uh, uh, there's a network being organized uh, among academic health centers and to and working with the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, to identify patients who have recovered and to begin scaling this up to harvest uh, the plasma 
and, and, all, and measure the antibodies to make certain that we're only using plasma from individuals with what are called high titers, high amounts of, of that uh, COVID antibody. So this is being done in blood banks at academic health centers uh, across the country. So far, there's about 20, I understand, mm -hmm. uh, that are being uh, in included in this. And, and that's, uh, that's all hands on deck trying to scale that up and, and actually can, in, in parallel, conduct the clinical trials to confirm that it's working, especially when you give it early on. Before we go into vaccines, um, what what what? How do you know if you have it? I mean, what are the what are the sure signs that that you that you, uh, as a as a patient, uh, would have uh, that that you ought to give give your doctor a call and, and let him know about? Right. So, well, there are no sure signs. So what we know is uh, mostly fev fever, cough, and shortness of breath, and. And especially when we're still in flu season, that, that's not very specific. So actually the World Health Organization has just issued a guideline saying that your positive rate for testing should be around one in 10 or 12, or roughly 12%. Uh, and, and the reason is if your testing is 60 to 70% positive, that means you're, you're not testing enough people. Uh, so that there is meaning that most people who get tested are gonna turn out not to have this virus and that's how we can capture uh, most of the cases. So it, it's not very specific. Uh, I would say that if you have fever and cough and you're concerned, you need to get tested. And certainly if you're short of breath, and that's, the, that's one of the worrisome signs because uh, the, can, this can cause a viral pneumonia and that's where you might need a more intensive, more intensive treatment. Okay, now let's talk about vaccines. I know you have a candidate um, I saw yesterday where Johnson & Johnson uh, teamed up with BARDA to, uh, to try to go to trials by September on, on some candidate they have. And we have a facility here at, uh, at Texas A&M uh, to produce the vaccines once folks come up with it. And so we're waiting on orders from uh, BARDA uh, or, or when and if a, a vaccine is developed to begin the mass production. But, Tell us about the, the prognosis for vaccines, um, how long it's gonna take, and, and particularly about the one that, that, that you're working on. Thanks, I mean, there's gonna be at least a dozen vaccines that go into clinical testing in the coming weeks and months. And I am pretty optimistic at the end of the day, we will have a vaccine. Uh, the, the, the big picture problem is this, uh, it, it takes time to, test that that vaccine is both safe and it actually works. And it's hard to rush those timelines, especially the safety component. You know, the, we've both had to deal with the anti-vaccine lobby over the years and they're, they're very aggressive. And one of the things they say is vaccines are not adequately tested for safety. Well, in fact, the opposite is true among the different pharmaceuticals. Vaccines are probably the single most tested uh, pharmaceutical we have for safety and that means it can Dr. Fauci, Dr. Tony Fauci is saying a year to 18 months. I would say that's even optimistic. You know, for instance, with Ebola, the Ebola vaccine, it took us five years. So that's a long way of saying, you know, vaccines have enormous promise for preventing this infection. I'm, I don't think we're going to have it by the end of 2020. So we won't have it necessarily for this epidemic. But remember what we're talking about, this is likely to become a global problem. It will uh, move into the Southern hemisphere. It'll go into Latin America. It'll go into India. It'll go into Bangladesh. It'll go into Southeast Asia. It'll go into Sub-Saharan Africa. And that's gonna be important for that vaccine or vaccine to, for global health use. It's also likely to take on some kind of regular pattern here in the United States some kind of seasonal pattern every year. We don't know that for sure. We thought that might happen for Zika virus infection as well, and that pretty much disappeared, but we have to uh, that, that, that possibility. In terms of our vaccine, we're focusing on uh, a low cost technology, a uh, straightforward recombinant protein technology that was used previously to license the hepatitis B vaccine. And the advantage of that one is there's a lot of capability of manufacturing a vaccine like that for global health. So we think our vaccine can be a, uh, an affordable and widely accessible vaccine for low and middle income countries as well as the United States. And that's, 
that's what we've been working on. And in my time as a Hegler Fellow uh, uh, here at the Institute for Advanced Studies at Texas A&M, that's been a lot of our uh, work, folk talking to some of the great policy experts that you have here in the School of Public Health and the Medical Center and the Vet School uh, about not just making the technology, but you know, Texas A&M has so many strengths and even things like social sciences, political science, foreign policy, how we're gonna get this vaccine out there to the, to the people who, who need them. And, 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 and this point is an important one because you know, I get asked so many times about uh, careers in global health. And I say, you know, it's great if you wanna get a medical degree or a PhD in science, but some of our biggest problems are social science problems. I mean, we should have had the, these vaccines ready to go before this coronavirus uh, epidemic. We knew coronavirus were a problem. So a lot of our failures are public policy uh, failures that we're not, the, the biomedical scientists are not engaging in this adequate dialogue with the social scientists, people in the humanities. And, and here's where an, an institution like Texas A&M I think really shines because people work together to solve big picture problems. And that's something very special that uh, that, that's here in College Station and the other campuses. And we have a company called, uh, or that's here, that's iBio, and it is a team with Texas A&M, and we have a proposal um, to the federal government and to BARDA now wait, waiting on um, them, and I know you do too. So it sounds like it's likely we'll come up with some treatment uh, before we come up with a vaccine. Is that fair to say? Yeah, you, you hit it perfectly. So, you know, the way I like to describe it is I look at the, the highest bar, the next rung down, next rung down, next rung down. So vaccines are about the highest bar there is in terms of timelines and cost and investment. Uh, that's, that's a several year process. Next one down are new, brand new mo uh, small molecule drugs, which are still hard to rapidly accelerate, but they generally move faster than vaccines then repurposing other existing drugs that are already out there towards this virus, like the hydroxychloroquine story that we talked about, or some of the antiretroviral drugs for HIV, HIV AIDS. And then the one that we have right now to go is that convalescent serum antibody therapy. So we should be looking at it like a, a portfolio of, of technologies. I mean, the good news is you know, we, the U.S. has some of the best research universities and institutes in the country, including Texas A&M. And if anybody's going to accelerate technologies, it's, it's going to be the United States. And I think universities here in Texas are going to have an important role in that. Well, we know, we know what people at risk and, and uh, older people should do and the precautions they should take. Are there any specific precautions uh, that a family with young children, in particular babies, should take that, that uh, they need to know about? Sure. Uh, well, certainly, you know, kids potentially could, even though they're often not getting sick, and we don't know why children are not getting as sick as adults, they can still transmit the virus. So that's, if you have individuals who are at risk, especially older individuals, uh, those with underlying diabetes or hypertension, you want to do that social isolation away from the kids as, as hard as that can be uh, sometimes. The one exception to kids not getting sick often is the fact that uh, infants are getting sick. So infants under, you know, under the age of one year of age, the Chinese have come out with studies from their experience in Wuhan, about 10% of infants are getting seriously ill. So uh, this is a disease uh, that affects the very young as well. And, and you want to uh, practice that social isolation for that reason. Yeah. Let me ask you one last question, doctor. Um, you know, I, I still have some friends of mine. I notice on the web there's all kinds of people that go, my God, why did they shut down the whole economy just, just for this? I mean, there are more people died of the flu than died of this, uh, at least so far, I guess. Uh, what, do you, what, what do you as a scientist uh, t tell those folks? Well, I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that, uh, yeah, sure, a lot of people die of influenza every year. We don't shut down the country for that. The, the numbers are around 12,000 to 50,000 people dying uh, annually for flu. So flu is a bad actor. The difference is 
This one looks like it's about four or five times more lethal than flu. Uh, and we're seeing it among older populations, older Americans, also individuals with underlying diabetes and hypertension. And now we're seeing a fair number of younger adults that more than we initially expected are getting very sick uh, uh, with this virus. So it, they're filling up ICUs and overburdening uh, the, ho the overburdening hospitals and intensive care units. So what we're looking at are, are numbers that are substantially larger than that 12 to 50,000. Uh, the Institute for Health Metrics is looking at around 80,000 Americans dying in the next two months. And Dr. Fauci and Dr. Burks, um, the White House briefings has been saying 100,000 to 200,000 deaths. So we'll see, uh, and, and the hope is that, and with the pro and the problem, of course, is without the benefit of a vaccine, all we have are 14th century methods to take this on, uh, or if we don't have the technologies, and that's social distancing. So uh, it's it's we we know it's a huge hit on the economy, but if we can prevent individuals from coming into hospitals and overwhelming the hospitals, that can make a big difference in the number who die. Let me explain that a little bit more. Um, right now in Italy, 10% uh, of COVID-19 patients are dying, very high mortality rate. And the reason is, as the numbers start to spike, hospitals become overwhelmed and the ICUs can't take care of all those patients. That's why you get the mortality numbers up. And the only way to manage that is to aggressively do the social distancing so you reduce the number of patients who show up in the ICU at, at, at any one time, especially uh, in, in our cities. And so that's the reason for the social distancing. We have another problem though here in Southeast Texas, now we have a lot of poverty and that poverty equates to high rates of underlying diabetes and hypertension and that's another, and renal disease. So that's another risk factor. So that's, so, um, you know, to put it in the starkest terms, we don't want to replicate in Houston or in Texas or, or, or uh, what's going on right now in New Orleans, where the case fatality rate is higher than it is in New York, around four to five percent. And that's a combination of one, their big surge because they didn't weren't on top of this quickly enough and allowed the Mardi Gras to go on and everything else. But also it was uh, the fact that that population is a lot of poverty a lot of African-Americans in poverty, uh, which have high rates of diabetes and hypertension. And uh, and that's certainly true in Houston as well. So I was on, I've uh, been talking to our elected leaders here in Houston, why you know, we have to be really careful because we, we could we could be the next shoe to fall uh, after New Orleans in terms of that high case fatality rate. Dr. Hotez, thanks a lot for being here with us. Uh, we really appreciate you taking your time. I know you're just as busy as uh, anybody in the world right now. And uh, we're especially uh, proud that you're, you're part of the uh, A&M family. Thank you for being here and for what you do for this country and this world. Thank you so much. And it's uh, great to uh, talk to you. And again, congratulations on everything Texas A&M is doing uh, to fight COVID-19 in America. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have today. Thank you for tuning in. We'll be back soon with another edition. Stay safe.